Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar titled Care for the Caregivers. Thank you all for joining us. We are going to get started. Please note all attendees are muted and the video is disabled. This session is also being recorded and the recording will be available within one to two business days on our website at ce.uci.edu. Please visit our free events page and click on On Demand tab to view the recording. Additionally, I'll also send an email once the recording is available along with a PDF copy of today's presentation. I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Keisha Batten Sankai and I'm one of the program coordinator here at the UCI Division of Continuing Education, specifically in the education and business programs. So for today, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit your questions throughout our presentation. And then I'll give you a brief overview of UCI Continuing Education as well as our gifted and talented education program, or as we call it here, GATE. And then I'll provide a program overview and registration information regarding the upcoming summer quarter, which will begin in June. I will then turn it over to our guest, Colleen Ferreira. And then at the end of Colleen's presentation, we'll have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I will leave you with the contact information so you can send over any additional question that we did not get to address. The camera and microphones have been disabled for participants. However, please utilize the chat feature. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see a row of icons. Click on the chat bubble icon and the panel will show up. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a chat message over to Robert at UCI and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. Now, if you have any questions for me or for Colleen regarding the content of the presentation, please feel free to submit in the chat throughout the presentation. And then if we have time, we will address it at the end. Be sure to send your questions to all panelists and all attendees. So here's a br overview of our um, programs that we offer here at UCI this Division of Continuing Education. As you can see, we offer multiple programs in multiple fields such as business and management, education, engineering, and environment facilities, and many more. There's something for everyone and there's short term courses, there's uh, a full certificate programs, there's everything that meets everyone's needs. So whichever that you may be interested in, everything is available in our website. And you can also look through it in our magazine here and here is the website to see it. Now, specifically, I want to talk about our program gate gifted and talented here's a brief overview of our gate specialized studies this program is taught by industry experts and the courses in our program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of the needs and issues of gifted learners this program was created for experienced and novice teachers parents and individuals interested in gate theory and practical applications now, while the current public offering of this program is being phased out, students are still welcome to enroll in the individual summer courses. This summer, we're offering courses on differentiated instruction and engaging students through technology. We also offer customized gate program offerings for school districts looking to train groups of teachers. Please reach out to us at edubis at ce.uci.edu if you are interested in bringing these courses to you. Right now, enrollment for summer quarter is currently open and the quarter begins on June 21st. So if you are interested in enrolling, you still have time to enroll either online or over the phone by calling our student service office at the number provided. You can find detailed course information and enroll in any available courses by clicking the green enroll buttons on the course schedule as shown in this GIF right here. And then you can find detailed course information and um, available courses and we encourage students to enroll early as classes fill up quite quickly so enroll early to secure your spot. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Colleen so she can provide an introduction and begin the portion of the presentation. And I'm going to stop sharing here so Colleen can share her presentation. Hi, right, thank you, Keja. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, do you see that okay? 
Yes. All right, great. Thank you. Yes, my name is Colleen Ferreira. I'm coordinator of social emotional learning at the Orange County Department of Education. And I'm so honored that you asked me to come and speak about something that's so near and dear to my heart, talking about supporting social emotional learning for adults and how we can really support and care for the caregivers who support our students. So just to go over really quickly, our objective for today is to talk about how we can explore SEL strategies, social emotional learning strategies that we can implement in a school setting to strengthen adult SEL. Now, as we go through this presentation, um, you'll notice that I'm going to be using the three signature SEL practices. It is a welcoming ritual that really helps um, bring us into a focus for what we're about to dig into today. We'll be doing some engaging practices. This is the second practice. And lastly, we'll end with an optimistic closure. So just to kind of kick off our presentation for today, please think about which of these quotes most resonates with you. You can just drop it into the chat box just to help bring our focus and, um, and begin our time today. Sleep, yes, sleep is so necessary. <laughs> Feeling that today too. All right, so let's just take a moment to reflect. We're gonna think about how you wanna feel every day. How would your best self want to feel? And just take a moment, you could write it down, you could drop it in the chat box if you want to, but how do you want to feel each day when you're at work or when you're at home? What feeling would you most like to sit with? And then think, how do you actually feel? Take a moment to think about that. How do you actually feel? Think about if these feelings are aligned, are they opposite? Do they not align? Now the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence actually surveyed thousands of US educators and asked the exact same question that I just asked you. And when they were asked how they wanted to feel, they said they wanted to feel excited, confident, joyful, happy. But how they actually felt was frustrated, stressed, overwhelmed. Now this study was done in 2017 and they found that 70% of the emotions that educators had been experiencing were unpleasant. Now, perhaps you can see some emotions that you share with these same educators from the study, and maybe you can see that there's a big disconnect between the emotions that you want to feel and the emotions that you actually feel. And this is why being able to manage your emotions in a helpful way is so important to our own well being. You know, these ongoing feelings displayed on the right can really lead to burnout and physical and emotional complications. Now to help set the stage for this session, we're going to take a moment to think about this quote from Mr. Rogers. If we can only make it clear that feelings are mentionable and manageable, we will have done a great service for mental health. For many people, discussing feelings can make them feel vulnerable and even weak, depending on the position of their power depending on their gender, their culture, and even their background. So how can we show the strength to be vulnerable? If you follow the work of Brene Brown, she explains that vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability is the emotion that we experience during times of uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Vulnerability is the core of all emotions to feel is to be vulnerable. And being able to have conversations around your emotions in a healthy way actually impacts your health. In 2017, they did a survey of 5,000 educators and they found that 70% of their workday, educators felt frustrated, overwhelmed, and stressed. 
And when I actually first read this statistic, I was still working in the classroom with students. And I totaled up the number of minutes that I was in the classroom, or yes, the number of minutes that I was in the classroom versus the total number of minutes that, that, I, um, that I worked in the day. And it was almost exactly 70% of my day that I worked with students in the classroom. I took out my breaks and my lunchtime. And that was just very shocking for me to think that 70% of my day I was working with my students and 70% of my day I was feeling these very unpleasant, strong emotions. So think about the implications for this. These emotions lead to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, addiction, and dementia. Google conduct conducted a five-year study on highly productive teams, and they found that psychological safety, being able to take risks and being vulnerable in front of each other, was the most important dynamic that set successful teams apart. Think about your staff as a team. What is being done to support the psychological safety of the educators at your site? Many times this is our life. Our signature move is bottling up our emotions and then having a completely disproportionate meltdown to something small, like not being able to find matching socks. And this is why we're going to be talking about building our emotional resilience today, because far too often, this is our signature go-to move. So when we are not vulnerable with our feelings to recognize and regulate them, we often lean on unhelpful strategies. Take a moment to think about what unhelpful action strategies or behaviors that you see here are your go-to unhelpful strategies if you're feeling stressed out at home or at work. What about when someone says something mean or hurtful to you? What is your go-to unhelpful action strategy? So it's really helpful for us to be self-aware that these are some of the strategies that we have used to help us cope with difficult situations or difficult emotions. And very soon we're gonna go into some helpful strategies that you can begin building into your toolkit when you're confronted unexpectedly with unpleasant emotions. Okay, so to really help ground us in the why for today, we're gonna to be looking at the California MTSS framework. And social emotional learning is one of the three features in the California MTSS framework. It is equally as important as academic instruction, behavior instruction, they are all on the same plane. And when we think about supporting our students' social emotional well-being, their skills, we have to also consider the educators' social emotional skills and well-being. If we are going to be good models and good instructors and to really understand this, we need to be able to practice this work and be supported ourselves. Now from the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, also known as CASEL, they are a clearinghouse of resources around social emotional learning. And they have identified four focus areas for systemic implementation. So you, you would begin with the yellow area of building foundational support and plan. That's your teaming structure, how you are going to create a vision and a mission for social emotional learning at your school site and really building that capacity from within and making plans for implementation. And if you look at the green areas of implementation, you're considering how to support the adults and how to support the students' social emotional competencies and skills. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on strengthening adult social emotional learning, and we'll be going into those specific action strategies to help them. Now, emotions are like waves. You can't stop them from coming, but you can choose how you respond, which ones to surf, dig your heels in, you could receive the full force of the blow, or you could just bob in the pleasantness of that emotion. Naming your emotions and developing emotional literacy skills to do so is the foundation to being able to regulate or manage your emotions. Now there's an importance in developing emotional literacy. Communicating our feelings precisely is the pathway to managing them effectively. 
And it also builds our self-awareness competency. So we're gonna do a little game, it's called this or that. And it's going to test how emotionally literate we are around these two emotions that we're going to, to play with today. So if you think uh, the definition for the emotion is one, that would be this, or choice two, it would be that. So we're going to see how emotionally lit literate we are around pressure. How would you define pressure? Is it one, being strained mentally or emotionally from too many demands and not enough resources? Or is it two, a feeling that something is at stake and it's dependent on our behavior? So I see two. Yes, it is a feeling that something is at stake and dependent upon our behavior. And for me, this was a big aha because pressure and stress are often used interchangeably. Stress is being strained mentally or emotionally from too many demands and not enough resources. But pressure is that something is at stake based on your behavior. And think about how differently you would approach that emotion or make an action plan to shift that emotion if you knew that feelings of pressure were based upon your behavior. If you're having a discussion with a student or with a child and they say that they are feeling stressed over a test, are they st truly stressed because they don't have the resource, they don't have the book, let's say, to study for? Or are they feeling pressure because they feel like they need to make their parents proud or they know that they need to get a certain grade, right? Are they putting that pressure on themselves? So what would you say? You would say, well, actually you're feeling pressure. So now we can make an action plan to study every single day to make sure that you can achieve your goal. So being able to have specific emotions for what you are feeling really is going to help make that action plan if you're going to shift that emotion. Now, Brene Brown describes a great analogy when it comes to the importance of emotional literacy. She says, imagine going to a doctor and trying to explain to him your symptoms, but your mouth is taped shut and all you can do is mumble and try to communicate what's wrong. That's what it's like if you don't have the emotional vocabulary to recognize and label specific feelings. Emotional intelligence doesn't mean being happy all the time. It means understanding our own emotions and others and to know their value. In the Harvard Business Review, companies were reporting high levels of exhaustion. What they found was that while these employees were exhausted, it wasn't because of their workload. They were actually exhausted because they were lonely. And that's the importance of emotional literacy, getting to the root of your feelings to be able to address the problem. Are you tired, overwhelmed? Think about this. How does it feel different when we use words like lonely versus exhausted? When you check in with your emotions in a non-judgmental way, you can identify the specific emotion. You could decide what you'd like to do with it. Do you wanna stay in this emotion? Do you wanna make a healthy plan to shift it? Do you wanna reach out to a trusted peer? Lean into a helpful action strategy? This is the core of emotion regulation. Now we've just reviewed recognizing understanding and labeling our emotions. Now we're gonna dive into what we can do with them. Managing our emotions isn't about suppressing them or controlling them or conforming them to someone else's idea about what we should do or what we should feel. We manage our emotions so that we can think clearly, we can make the best decisions, we can form and maintain healthy relationships and we can experience well-being. Now there are infinite strategies for managing emotions and they really depend upon a lot of different factors that make you who you are. And you're gonna be building a toolkit of regulation strategies throughout your whole life as you adopt new ones, drop old ones, depending on the situation and who you are over time. And it really begins with asking ourselves the question, is this emotion I'm feeling helping me? And we have to consider its purpose. Early in the pandemic, feelings of anxiety actually helped us stay safe by socially distancing. 
the feeling of pressure can make us make a reasonable plan about getting tasks done. So whether we decide to maintain, shift, or sit with an emotion, all of them require some amount of regulation. So we're gonna get into some healthy action strategies that you can use in the moment of unexpected triggers. But before we get into that, here are some intentional proactive strategies that we can do every day to help us build our emotional well-being. It's like building up cognitive reserves that will help support resilience when you experience challenges. To begin, think about your body. How can you take care of yourself? Through mindful breathing, healthy habits, relaxing, healing touch. If you're a hugger, that can be very helpful visualization to calm yourself and relax, or if needed, knowing that you need to seek professional help. Connecting with others, maintaining those relationships is a very healthy emotion management technique. Being able to give and receive social support, spending that quality time with others who will help support you, being able to ask for help, apologize, forgive others to listen, being present and being heard and using humor in situations that will help buffer you. And finally, being able to establish routines that are going to help set you up for healthy um, emotion management, setting goals, problem solving, being able to take small breaks throughout the day, celebrating small and large successes and finding things that you enjoy. So think for a moment, what strategies help to support you when you need to relax at the end of a stressful day? What do you find helpful? What about if you're feeling angry or frustrated? Which one of these can help you manage it effectively? So now we're going to go over four different categories of emotion regulation. And within each of those categories, the number of specific strategies is limitless. The strategy that you use will depend upon the moment, the context of the situation, the emotion that you're feeling, your age, your personality, your culture, what the trigger is, and what outcome you want from this situation. So the first one that we're going to look at is the forward-looking strategy. Now this really requires us to be self-aware. We have to know what will trigger us or what will bring us joy and why. So we think about how we might feel in an expected situation and we come up with a plan ahead of time to prevent unpleasant emotions. So sometimes we can't avoid a situation, we just, Imagine every possible scenario. We imagine what criticisms that could possibly come up, what barriers um, you would face, and you develop a really well thought out response. This is the strategy that you would use when you wanna prevent those times where you're going to bed at night and you think, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that, right? So you're coming up with that plan ahead of time knowing that you might be facing a difficult situation. But this doesn't just have to be around unpleasant situations. This could also be around pleasant experiences. You can give yourself a reason to find joy by scheduling it. So if you know you're gonna have a really tough week, scheduling something that you really enjoy at the end of the week will help give you that pleasant feeling, um, something to look forward to. The second strategy is the attention shifting strategy. And this is when you can look away from a stressful encounter and you can speak to yourself as if you are a friend, giving them advice in the third person, like Colleen, it's gonna be okay. You can get through this, you're strong. And it just gives you that psychological distance from the experience and a way to be empathetic to yourself. You could do things like checking Instagram or social media. You could binge watch Netflix for a while procrastination can actually give us some time and create that emotional distance as long as we use it wisely, of course, right? We don't want to procrastinate forever. That's definitely not going to be helpful in the long run. 
Now, the third is cognitive reframing strategies. And this is when we reimagine or we reframe the unpleasant emotional experience, and then we react instead to that new vision. So for example, you consciously choose to view a situation in a way that will bring about the least negative emotion inside. Perhaps you take the perspective of the person who's triggering you and you just assume positive intentions. Researchers at Harvard found that students who were told to think of anxiety that they were feeling before a test as being beneficial actually performed better on exams than a control group just by reframing that experience. And then finally, we have the meta moment. And this is very unique to the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. It's called a meta moment because it's a moment about a moment. And in that moment, you are self-aware and you sense the shift, right? You sense that you are triggered unexpectedly. So then you stop and you pause, you take a breath, you can ask yourself questions, you can ask yourself, what would my best self do right now? And this helps to redirect our attention toward how we'd like to be seen, how we would like people to experience our company. And it really focuses us on our values. And then finally, we choose a strategy that will help us move towards our best self. So take a moment to reflect and think, what adjectives characterize your best self? How do you want to be seen? Think about it. Write it down. And every time we believe that we've successfully used one of these strategies to regulate our feelings, we want to make sure that we reflect on that experience and think, did this strategy work for this situation? And would this strategy be a good strategy to use in the long run in the future? So now we just explored several emotion regulation strategies. So now what do we do with all of this information? I love the quote that says, a goal without a plan is just a wish. So I wanted to provide you with some actionable steps to support you in creating a plan for yourself to support healthy emotion management strategies. So to begin, check in with your feelings. Check in with your feelings frequently and name them and then choose a helpful action strategy, whether you want to maintain or shift that feeling. Identify small goals. Think about those strategies that will help build up your resilience and think about those four regulation strategies. What are your goals? And then consider what barriers might prevent you from making these goals a reality. Time, family, lack of motivation, expected triggers. And then to, to address those barriers, think about how you can schedule it to help support you perhaps have an accountability buddy to help uh, keep you on track. So now we're gonna move on to co-regulation. We can't talk about emotion regulation without mentioning co-regulation. Co they coexist, they are codependent upon each other because you're always going to be around others. So let's go over the definition. Emotional co-regulation is a process between two people where one person's emotions are continuously influenced by the actions and emotional re reactions of the other person. Emotional co-regulation plays a critical part in our classrooms and it's how we present ourselves to our students, but also in our day-to-day -day lives. It's how we interact with one another as colleagues. Co-regulation is becoming aware of how our vocal tone, our facial expressions and our body language influence others around us. For example, when a teacher is pleasant, and smiles and greets students as they walk into the classroom, that helps the students feel welcomed and safe. But if the teacher is shouting or if the teacher sounds very stressed and is dysregulated to the point where students can see and feel and hear the frustration, that creates feelings of anxiousness and sometimes fear in students. And of course, we don't want our students to feel this way. 
So in the classrooms, teachers can co-regulate with students through modeling and through social emotional behavior support. This helps the students' cortisol levels drop, which is the stress hormone, which helps them to be able to handle stress better. The oxytocin and dopamine hormones that help activate feelings of calmness, closeness, help them focus, learn, and stay engaged and motivated. And it helps to promote feelings of well being in the brain and the body. And as you can see, emotion co regulation is part of emotion regulation. In order for us to help colleagues or students deactivate their stress, to be able to bond and support their learning, we need to first be aware of our emotions and manage our emotions. So we'll lastly go over five steps that can help manage a stressful classroom moment. Even though this example is referring to a classroom, it could be adapted to any situation, even with adults. So as I go through this, try to envision either scenario within the classroom or with colleagues. Now this sequence is meant to provide a general framework. We know that in real life, things are a lot messier. So just use this as general action steps. So let's say that you notice a child is dis dysregulated or a behavior catches your eye. What do you do first? First, you manage your own emotions. We can't help someone else ourselves if we are dysregulated. So try to stay in control by managing those emotions. Try to access our prefrontal cortex so we can be a positive role model for students. And once you are stable, then you can move on to your student. So then you help the students with their emotions. You're gonna to have to figure out when is a good moment to approach the child. It could be privately or it could be after class. You use your judgment and your discretion on this. And in doing this, you help them settle their physical activation by being present, by being patient. You could offer them to take a walk. They could go get a drink of water. You could remind them to breathe. You could use settling phrases like, you're safe here. Take your time. I'm here for you. I noticed this during class or I can see something's really bothering you. How can I help you? Or we'll figure this out together. And then be genuinely curious. Remember that behavior does not equal emotion. We can't assume that we know why a certain behavior is showing up with a student. We can help them explore their feelings by reviewing with them the story of what happened from their point of view and allow them to tell you how they are feeling. And then just listen and reflect without judging. Your goal is to really understand their perspective and to help them put their feelings into words. Help them unspool their version of the events, help them name their feelings accurately and validate their feelings as okay, no matter what emotion they're feeling. And then going on to step three, help them brainstorm and strategize. Think together about what the problem is here, what the problem is to be solved, and what next steps might be helpful. And just focus on the short-term strategy. Help them identify their strategies for dealing with the emotion. You could share what you do to help de-escalate yourself. And then just ask about strategies for dealing with the situation. Try to ask questions that can help them think about solutions to their own or help them to problem solve. Prompt them to think about what they could do next. Like what have you done in the past that worked or how would their best self handle this situation if they were going to be giving a friend advice about it. And then as a last resort, if they can't generate anything on their own, you could offer your ideas or suggestion if they need them. Sometimes perspective tape taking helps generate solutions. So ask them to consider a different perspective or to have a conversation with the person who is involved in the situation. And then honestly, sometimes people just need you to be present and listen and just to support them through their grief. You can just ask, do you want me to help you problem solve? Or do you want me to just be here for you? Sometimes students just need to feel seen and heard. Now, again, these steps are not linear. And I know that this is a lot of work. And then finally, you're going to want to start bringing the conversation to a close. Try to end with a positive focus. Offer your support in the future. 
If the child needs additional support, offer to um, help introduce them to the school counselor or other support personnel who could support them, and then follow up with them. Check back later to see how they're feeling. And if they need more support, think about who can provide that ongoing support to the student. And then for yourself, just remember, be your best self by striving to be the compassionate, culturally responsive emotion scientist and not the emotion judge. And as we wrap up our time together, we'll use our final three signature SEL practice, our optimistic closure. Let's think about looking forward. From today, what is one thing you're looking forward to sharing with a colleague? You can write it down, you could drop it into the chat box, or just think, what is something from today that you are going to share with someone else? And that's all I have for right now, Keja. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Sounds good, thank you. I will go ahead and share my screen again. Oh, oh no, hold on. Okay, hopefully everyone can see it. So thank you so much, Colleen, for that wonderful presentation. Um, if anyone have any questions, you can submit it in the chat box right now. Or if you can't think of anything right now and then we end the, end the webinar and then you're like, oh, wait, I just have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. You can send a question to our email here at jubis at ce.uci.edu. If it's something that's pertaining to Colleen's presentation, I will forward it to her and she can answer it and then I'll reply back. If it's something about the great program, um, I will be able to answer those as well. Here is our program contacts. Again, if you have any questions, you have any concerns, or just want to learn more about the GATE program, here are the email, the phone number, and our website for all of your um, information. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so I think it's safe to say that we can end this webinar right now. Thank you again, Colleen, for presenting. I wish everyone a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>